Okay, this is um, Dave, and we've called it Dave for a number of reasons. One, we wanted to link up with Hugo. The other, it happens to be my father's name and John's brother's name as well. But what it really stands for is Digital to Analog Veritas in Extremis, which means truth in extreme. Um, and the development of this was very much based upon what we would achieve with Hugo and the mysteries as to why the Hugo's musicality performance that, that I'd gotten with it, where the actual technical performance was coming from. So um, clearly with this we've got virtually relatively unlimited budget in terms of component parts, so it's a much bigger FPGA. It's ten times more complicated than the FPGA within Hugo. Um, and it meant that I could do a lot more things. So we've got 164,000 taps, um, it's improved on the WTA filtering, so the algorithm itself has been enhanced. Um, and it's filtering up to 256 times on the FIR filter, and then from 256 times it's then further filtered up to 2,000. So you, you finally times. managed to do that? Yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, the, the running at 256 times uh, with an FIR filter is quite an achievement. No one's ever done that, that rate before because... Um, it's a world know, record. It's certainly a world record. It's got 166 DSP cores inside there, um, all running in parallel to create the data that, that you need. And one of the core concepts and core problems that we've had with digital audio has been converting from sampled data back to the original continuous analog waveform. And if you look at the mathematics um, the sampling theory, um, and you realize that if you have an infinite tap neck filter that infinitely oversamples, um, you will perfectly reconstruct the original analog waveform. waveform. Um, and as digital engineers, we've underestimated the importance of getting back to the original continuous sine wave, the original continuous signal, um, in terms of timing accuracy. And um, what I've been working on with this is enhancing that and getting much more accurate in terms of the time resolution. Um, and it's, it's proven to be a, a big benefit. The other second major strand um, with, within this was the noise shaper. Now, the noise shaper takes the 24 bit, 104 megahertz, um, heavily filtered signal and then converts it into five bits, which then feeds into the pulse array noise shapers. So that goes to the discrete pulse array outputs, which is the actual analog part. So the performance of the noise shaper makes a, obviously a big, big difference to the overall performance. Um, and it's now compatible with uh, DST, Quad DST? It, yeah, it'll run with um, 512 DST. But it will convert to PCM uh, it prior to, to the... PCM, uh, um, but it's non-decimation. And I've improved the filtering process. So um, we had some criticism about the fact that I decimated it down, even though it, it was doing it for good sound quality reasons. It was sounding better than the previous filters, which didn't decimate. Mm -hmm. These filters are as advanced as the decimation filters, but they don't decimate. Um, and it, it means it's a, it's a much more complicated way of doing so it. So for you, uh, decimate is like decimate? There's nothing. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with decimation but what I underestimated was the actual performance that you need the decimation to work to and I was working with decimation accuracies of 140 dB with this, this filter because um, I expected that would be good enough and it actually turned out that's not good enough but there's no in principle there's no problem in decimation so long as you use a WTA filter after it to reconstruct the time um, but when you listen to the same attenuation that I've got on these filters that don't decimate against the decimation versions, the non-decimation versions does sound noticeably better. And you can see it on the measurements as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can see little, little distortion coming out at minus 140 dB. Um, and it's 140? Minus 140. And that's due to the fact that the decimation filter is only attenuating to 140 dB. And it's actually been quite an interesting exercise because Next year we're doing the Pro Audio A to D converter, so I need to do decimation filters for that, 
So this has given me some insight as to the requirements from a sound quality point of view of what you need. And what you certainly need is better than 140 dB performance on decimation. And when you look at some of the pro audio filters, some of them are only 6 dBs worth of attenuation. So they certainly aren't working to 140 dB and they certainly won't be working to the level that I'll be working to on the Pro Audio HD converter uh -huh. for decimation. But getting back to the noise shaper part, um, one of the curious things I found with, with Hugo when I was um, optimizing the, the performance of it was that when you get to a certain point, the hardness and the smoothness of the sound doesn't change. But if you, as you improve the performance of the noise shaper, the perception of depth improves. Um, and I'd done as best as I could do with Hugo, given the size of gates that I had available. So with this thing, of course, we've got a lot more gates available. So I started on the process of doing listening tests, evaluating what the level that needs to be performance that you needed. I started off originally with Hugo's performance, which is about 200 dBs worth of performance for the noise shaper. So, so finally you have opened the big gate of Kiev. The big gate of... <laughs> it's, it's a musical piece oh, right. by Mussorgsky. So. Okay. <laughs> um, so I started with that level and then upped it to 220 dB uh, because there are ways of designing the noise shaper. It's, it's, it's the digital performance in band that you're, you're trying, to, mm -hmm. trying to improve. And the depth got better. And then 240 dB, the depth got better again. 260 dB, the depth got better again. And there seemed to be no linear to, to it. And then I completely redesigned the noise shapers because I could see this was a, a major issue. Um, and I ended up with 350 dB worth of performance. 250 dB? 350. 350 so dB. When you look at it, do a digital simulation. That's theoretical. That's actual, actual, but it's digital domain. Oh. So it's it's what the actual output would be if there was no analog noise, no jitter, yes. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So what you what you do is you do a simulation, and you put in a 48-bit signal, um, and that's used as the input to the noise shaper. So it's 48-bit accurate, completely perfect sine wave, and then you look at the five bits output from the noise shaper. Um, actually, I, I sum the individual pulse array elements, do an FFT of that, um, and then you can see the distortion of noise. And you can see it's 350 dBs in-band performance. So it, it's extraordinary levels of performance. But what I can get my head around and what I can understand is why this attribute changes the perception of depth. Um, and it, it's quite it's easy to hear. Um, I use a, an organ piece and it's in a cathedral and it's supposed to sound a couple of hundred feet away because that's the way you listen to <laughs> organs in cathedrals. Um, and um, when you ch adjust these levels, you can hear the organ get moving backwards and forwards. Um, and it's really very bizarre. It's like a zoom. It, yeah, and uh, it, it's very, very bizarre because I cannot understand, I cannot accept that the brain requires 350 dBs performance level. But that's it, what's happening. Is that, that artificial? Um, no, that it's is the actual level. So if you had perfect... I mean, I mean the, the sensation, it's artificial, it's like... Uh, no, 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 because... It's, if you it's play accurate. A it's accurate. If you play a recording that has no reverb, or it's close by to vocals, mm -hmm. so it just sounds in the front of the loudspeakers, then it'll just sound in the front of the loudspeakers. It mm -hmm. won't add extra depth to it. Mm -hmm. It's not like the noise shape is creating more reverb to create an artificial impression of mm -hmm. depth. What it's doing is it's, it's accurately reproducing the cues that the brain uses to reconstruct the sound, the sound stage. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can understand is whether the problem that we're getting is down to some kind of weird mechanism when the noise shaper gets converted to analog and it's doing something strange that requires this level of performance. So it's not actually 350 dB's performance but something else that's going on or whether it really is does require 350 that's, dB's performance. That's for you to that's for find out to next find year. Out next, well, maybe it'll take a bit longer than that. But uh, Thank uh, you, it's, Rob. it's certainly a puzzle. Thank you very much.